Some viewers have asked how I produce the time-lapse videos of the Milky Way galaxy that I include in all of my astrophotography videos. To answer that, I've recorded this tutorial to give you guys a step-by-step -step guide to creating your own night sky time-lapse using software in the Adobe Creative Suite. First we need to talk about interval shooting, capturing frames at a specified interval. Most of the cameras I regularly use have a built-in feature that automates this action, but if your camera does not, you may want to purchase an intervalometer accessory. My first time-lapse was captured by manually pressing the shutter once every 20 seconds, so if you don't want to be that involved in the process for literally hours on end, an intervalometer is a must. While I can't show you how to access this feature as an included software process for every camera that has it, here is what it looks like on a few of my regular models. From the back of the Canon R6, first you'll press the menu button above the LCD screen and to the left of the viewfinder. Use the multi-controller to switch over to the sixth page under the shooting menu tab. While the interval timer line is highlighted, press the center of the multi-controller to select it. On the following screen you'll select the enable option, which will show you some parameters to set your interval. By pressing the info button, you can set the time between interval shots and the number of shots to be taken. Setting it to the lowest setting will save you time, and on Canon cameras, setting the number of shots to zero will lead to continuous shooting until you stop the camera or the SD card runs out of space. Since this kind of sequence requires hundreds of shots, we're going to keep it there. Using the multi-controller, select OK. That's it. Now you're ready to shoot. Now let me show you how this is done on the A7R4. Press the menu button above the LCD screen and to the left of the viewfinder. Using the control wheel, navigate over to the second screen under the Camera Settings 1 tab. Here you can choose to activate or deactivate long exposure noise reduction. For recording time lapses, I recommend turning this setting off because leaving it activated will double your shooting time as the camera captures a noise profile for each individual exposure. On the next screen, you will see Interval Shoot function as the third line down. Select this by pressing the button in the middle of the control wheel. On the following screen, select Interval Shooting and select On. You may want to give yourself some time after starting the sequence so as not to create smearing on the first frame from camera shake, so set the shooting start time accordingly. We will want to leave the shooting interval as short as possible, so we'll set it to one second. Set your number of shots next, keeping in mind that every 30 photos will translate to one second of normal NTSC video. And that's it. Now your Sony Alpha camera should be ready to shoot your time lapse. Now for the camera I have used most to create time lapses, the process is a little bit different. On some cameras in the A6000 series, you can download apps to the camera, and for the A6500, that is the best way to capture a time lapse. Installing these apps requires a connection to your computer. You can find instructions on how to do this on the support pages of the Sony website. I have already downloaded the app that I need, so let's locate it by pressing the menu button, then using the control wheel, navigate to the Applications tab, then select Application List. Right here on my page of downloaded applications is the Time Lapse app. I select that and then wait for it to load. There are several presets given here, but we will simply use the custom setting. This will lead us to a modified shooting screen. Once here, we will press the menu button and then select Application Settings. For the most flexibility in post, select images for your format. Keep the interval at the lowest setting to save time. Then select the amount of shots you want to take. Press the button in the center of the control wheel, and then press the menu button. That's it. You can now initiate a time-lapse capture from this screen. Now let's switch out to the field. As always, it all begins with the right camera settings. Make sure your aperture is open to a wide setting to allow the most light through and that your lens is focused on the stars before shooting. I captured this sequence at 10 second exposures at an ISO of 6400, but I've also done 15 seconds at 3200. It all depends on your location and the camera you're using. Feel free to experiment. When you're happy with what you captured, transfer those files to your computer. Then what I do is open Adobe Bridge. Some prefer Lightroom because it's simple, but for batch editing, Bridge has some powerful tools, so that's been my preference for years. Select all of your photos by holding Ctrl or Command A, and then click on the Camera Raw icon near the top of the application. This will open all of your images in the Camera Raw sub-application. Once inside, you'll want to use the Select All command again to make sure you're editing every image concurrently. Before we get into how to grade these images, let's talk about this somewhat newer feature inside Camera Raw. If you open the Detail tab, 
there is a denoise button. Since we didn't use noise reduction during our shoot, you may want to apply that now. Previously, denoising in Adobe was not that great, but this new feature does a surprisingly good job in my opinion. But what I have found is that the results will differ dramatically from camera to camera, so you need to decide for yourself. I'm not sure why, but sometimes it seems to process separate stars as a single streak. For posting to Instagram or other social media sites, I don't necessarily mind tiny flaws like this, but take a good look at several important detail areas in your image to help assess the necessity of noise reduction. If you do decide to use this feature, be aware that it will take a long time. So maybe start this process right after you get home from a night shoot and then come back to it after a nice little nap. Here I have selected and opened the new denoised images in Camera Raw. Once again, be aware of whether all of your images or just one is selected before applying changes. Now you may want to edit your images differently from this, and that's perfectly reasonable. The only wrong answer would be to add too much sharpening or saturation. Well, and also definitely don't be one of the scumbags who does this. We're all getting pretty tired of seeing this get attention on social media. All I'm saying is do what feels right to you, but this is how I like to edit my sequences. I'm going to start by dropping the temperature to give my sky a little more of a blue look and bring out the violets in the core of the galaxy. The green in this image does feel a bit overwhelming, but let's see if we can't fix that later with a mask. These next three sliders may not work as nicely for you depending on which camera you use, but for my A6500 long exposures, I usually get a really nice outcome from dropping the highlights, raising the shadows a bit, as it does seem to just select the dark areas I want brightened, and then, surprisingly enough, raising the whites to make the stars pop. It honestly doesn't blow out any part of the scene when I do this, but your results may vary. Some people like to use this new texture slider. You may like the result and you may not, so just be sure to check real close before deciding. For clarity, it helps to check both close up and at the wide view. I think I do like adding just a bit of clarity for this sequence. But this next slider is where the real magic happens for images taken by this camera. Dehaze seems to do a fantastic job of creating contrast while accurately respecting the fidelity of the gas clouds that make galaxy images unique. Just like with the others, you don't want to overdo it, so just play around until it feels right. For this image, I'm also going to drop the vibrance just a little bit, giving it more of a natural feel to my eye. We'll address color more in depth in just a moment. For now, let's open the Optics tab. If you're using a manual lens like I typically do, then you'll need to manually select the make and model. Mine is the Rokinon 12mm, and the program already knows that I'm using a Sony camera, so that's all set. In this tab, we can choose to do some post-processing distortion and vignetting removal. This is entirely up to you though. Some of you may like the little vignetting left in. I think I like how this looks after just the default settings, so I'm going to keep it here. All right, now I want to attack some of these issues we're still seeing with my foreground by using a mask. Now, technically you could use these smart selectors here, but I found that the AI gets really wonky when editing multiple images, and it also takes a lot of processor time. So I'm just going to use the brush tool. Set your brush size and just paint the area you want to focus on for isolated alterations. The main thing I'm trying to correct in this particular example is this green color. This was a place with a lot of vegetation, but this just doesn't look natural to me. A little bit of green in the sky actually is a natural outcome of a long exposure, but with the ground, let's see if we can't dial it down a bit by raising the tint and then playing around with the hue. I think that looks a lot better. Maybe I'll drop the saturation a little bit too. Yeah, that seems fairly natural to my eye. All right, so we could do a lot more edits if we wanted to, maybe even incorporate some batch actions in Photoshop, but for the kind of videos I make, this process is usually more than enough to get a great final video. So once you're done with your edits in Camera Raw, you're not going to click Open or Done. Instead, what you want to do is go up to the top here and click on the Convert and Save icon. In this Save Options box, you're given a few important options. Let's first take a look at the sizing options. You will most likely want to resize your images before we turn them into a video. You certainly can format your images for 4K or even 8K video if your camera resolution is high enough, but if you're just posting to social media, I really wouldn't recommend that. If you're going to post to something like Instagram Reels though, and you want to add some movement within a vertical video, you'll just want to make sure that your height is at or above 1920 for the best results. In this case, that translates to a value of 2880 for the width in order to maintain my original aspect ratio. Of course, we'll be cropping this later, but for now this works. Next, let's go up to the naming section. 
This is very important for our next step in Premiere. What you'll want to do is set this to a four digit serial number. Putting all of your images into a numerical sequence is what makes it easy for the program to recognize them as a series ready to be converted to video, which I'll show you in just a moment. Also make sure that you are starting at one and be sure to put the images you're about to create into a separate folder of their own. Then just click save. This is going to take a while, so we'll just jump forward to the next step. So now the JPEG images have been created and we're ready to convert them into a video. Open Adobe Premiere Pro and create a new project. Right now you don't really need to do anything other than give your project a title and click create. With the project open, simply double click inside the project assets window to open the import function. Navigate to where your newly created JPEG images are and then select the first image. Because we correctly named these files in a numerical order, the program gives you the option to import this as an image sequence. If we did not name them in this fashion, this box would not be available. So go ahead and check image sequence and then click open. Now your images have been imported and automatically sequenced as a video right here in the assets window. By default, this video will be set to the standard NTSC 29.97 frames per second. But if you would like to alter that, simply right click on the asset, go up to modify, and then select interpret footage. From here, you can change the frame rate to whatever you desire. I like to use 30 frames per second for social media. Click OK. Now all we have to do is click and drag the sequence over the new timeline icon. Let's take a quick look at how it turned out. Right out of the gate, that is not too bad. Now sometimes Premiere seems to flatten the look of your photos. If you find that you don't like the way tones are being represented as footage inside Premiere, you can choose to use that interpret footage feature before creating a new timeline and use this selection to override the color space to Rec 709. That's completely up to you, it just might be helpful to know. One thing you may notice depending on how Camera Raw handles shadows in relation to your camera is a little bit of flickering in some areas. There are a few things that people might recommend trying to remedy this, but what I found works really great is a plugin by Revision called DeFlicker. If you're needing to smooth out your footage a bit more, I'd encourage you to check it out. One additional thing that I'll show you guys before we export this video is how to apply additional adjustments to moving elements. Once you're seeing your photos as a completed video sequence, you may find further corrections necessary, or you might just want to add more punch to the scene. Let's just say, for example, that we feel like this galaxy needs a little more contrast. What we'll do is go to the Effects panel and search for Lumetri Color. Click and drag the effect onto the sequence to apply it to the footage. Now we'll click on this oval to create a new mask. We'll adjust the size and feather of the mask while set to the first frame in the sequence, then create a keyframe. Then, we'll jump to the last frame of the sequence and rotate and reposition our mask, which will automatically create another keyframe. Verify that this mask is following your element correctly, and then you can proceed to making modifications. Let's bump up both the white value and the contrast to see what that gives us. That's pretty cool. I personally will just leave this sequence without any edits because I like the falloff we already achieved when editing the images, but now you have the option. Now, all that's left is to decide how we're going to format this video for publishing. Because we made sure to maintain a vertical height of 1920 pixels, we now have the option in our sequence settings to convert this sequence into a vertical video for platforms that favor that format. But if we're just going to put this in a YouTube video, we can change our settings to a normal 1920 width by 1080 height. Since our original images are taller than that, we will need to modify the scale in order to fit the new parameters. Since this is a narrower aspect ratio than what the camera captured the images at, we have to decide what we want to keep in the frame, which can be adjusted using the position value in the effects control window. Of course, this is also how you'd adjust the framing had we chosen to do a vertical video as well, and you can of course use keyframes inside this function in order to create motion in your time lapse if you like. And that's pretty much it. Your video is ready to export as an MP4 or however you like it. I hope you enjoyed this walkthrough video. If you found this tutorial helpful, let me know in the comments how you plan to use this information. As always, you can stay tuned to this channel for more photography comparisons and informational videos to come, or check out my Instagram to see what I'm shooting this week. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you on the next one.